Great. So, um, so good morning, everyone. It's seven o'clock uh, uh, here on the West Coast. The sun is creaking over the horizon, and we have a very interesting looking session coming, which should be um, a bit different from the previous one. So, I think the first talk is by Ian Harms. And, Ian, please take it away. All right. Thank you very much. I think I've just shared my screen again. Okay. Do you still see my screen? No. Hello? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, good. Um, great, thanks. So <clears throat> um, I will um, get back from uh, quantum gravity to, to Newtonian gravity and uh, even more so back to terrestrial Newtonian gravity. So a uh, basic stuff, but something that uh, starts to haunt uh, high precision experiments, um, especially today in gravitational wave detection, we are carefully looking into the effects of terrestrial um, gravitational background in our measurements, which so far haven't really played a role yet, but um, that's going to change very soon, we, we believe. Um, so on this slide, um, well, the, the, the pictures are all pretty pictures. They are not coming out of any analyses done for gravitational wave detection. But what I want to show is that when we talk about gravitational background noise, then typically we, we, we um, mean noise produced by ambient fields. Uh, there are, there's other stuff that can produce gravity perturbations for sure, but this is the, the, the parts that are uh, most difficult to, to deal with. So the gravity perturbation produced by seismic fields, by temperature fields, and by the acoustic field. And um, something, you know, which, um, okay, maybe to just say a word, I'm, I'm not going to mention uh, later the, the, the temperature fields anymore. This is a little bit of a tricky part because um, it depends on more complicated processes in the atmosphere in reality, because what happens there is that you have a temperature field that is in reality stationary. It doesn't really fluctuate very quickly. But then uh, wind can transport it by your location. And this upconverts the, the gradients into actual fluctuations. And um, that is a noise that <clears throat> probably is not going to be relevant uh, for gravitational wave detection, but maybe to some other experiments. In any case, uh, also the models so far are quite poor. Here you see, for example, a coupling model between temperature fields and, and gravitational acceleration. If uh, the temperature field is produced by turbulent mixing, but uh, it depends really on frequency. There, there can be low frequencies where turbulent mixing is not such a good model anymore. Um, you can generally see that the coupling between these uh, fluctuating environmental fields and the, and the gravitational uh, and the test masses, if you want, um, all have a similar form. It's like some amp spectrum that characterizes the, the amplitudes of the ambient field divided by some power of frequency and then times an exponential term. And the exponential term um, typically contains a distance between test mass and something else like the surface or, you know, depending on how large your buildings are or something like that, divided by some characteristic speed, uh, be it the speed of sound, the speed of seismic waves or the, the wind speed. Anyway, this is this is anyway what we what we mean when we talk about gravitational noise in our field. Um, if you summarize what we have modeled well so far, more accurately, I would say, compared to other things, then this could be summarized in a plot like this. So here you have um, um, shown gravitational noise uh, in acceleration per root hertz, and so going from 0 0.1 millihertz all the way to 10 hertz, and um, it's it's uh, interesting to show it in this unit in this unit because that is something that is a property of the of the actual uh, environmental field. How this gravitational noise in, in acceleration turns into uh, a measurement noise is really depending then in the end on the details of the experiment, how much it is a gradient experiment, how much it is an acceleration experiment. But um, anyway, the what you can see here is that between let's say uh, zero point one millihertz and uh, two millihertz, for example, we have observations of uh, this gravitational noise from superconducting gravimeters. So people <clears throat> uh, see the noise and they even subtract it partially using uh, pressure sensors because the origin of that noise is um, the pressure field of the atmosphere. 
And then things that we haven't observed yet, but modeled is um, the acoustic noise at higher frequencies. That has a different coupling than what that is the, the, the you know the model at low frequencies is a bit different than the one that is here used at higher frequencies, uh, and then also uh, for example um, underground and surface seismic acceleration backgrounds. So that's all gravitational uh, noise. Um, and well, interesting is that for example below 0 0.1 hertz you really start to see domination by the atmosphere. Above 0 0.1 hertz, they are all kind of getting similar. Maybe seismic, um, you know, um, gravitational noise is um, typically more important uh, above 0 0.1 hertz. But below 0 0.1 hertz, it's clearly the atmosphere that that you have to worry about, and not the seismic field. Okay, so these numbers somehow have to be turned into actual measurement noise. And um, now, something that you have to understand. So what I have shown on the last slide is in reality the natural background. So something like that you can see underground if there are no other perturbations uh, by machines or something like that um, at remote sites. If, however, you look at the Virgo detector, the you know one of the gravitational wave detectors today, then what you see is that uh, most of the noise in the relevant band is really produced by the infrastructure. And this can be ventilation systems, some pumps of the vacuum system, chillers uh, for, for the temperature control. So there are many uh, ways that you can perturb your environment, and these can often lead to excess noise by more than a factor of 10 compared to the natural backgrounds. And so <clears throat> this is something very important to keep in mind, uh, which is for us, of course, you know, when we when we plan a new site, for example, are not really creating infrastructure there that 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 spoils your environment. So you want to be as close to the ambient uh, natural background as possible with your environmental perturbations. Um, and so <clears throat> I will come back to, the, to, to this later because it's an um, interesting point. Okay. Now, as an example, uh, if, you, if you use the acceleration noise that I showed on the first slide and then you, you know, turn it into um, gravitational wave strain noise, then in Virgo, it looks like this basically. Um, so here you have, uh, you know, two um, sensitivity curves of the Virgo detector for the future. So these are the next two upcoming science runs. And these are kind of optimistic uh, sensit uh, sensitivities that, that we expect for these two science runs. And um, here is, um, here are two actually um, gravitational noise uh, predictions from seismic fields. And uh, something that, you know, first of all, you can see even, you know, even in the future, I mean, the, the, the science run that we are looking at here is really like, you know, a few years into the future. Even then, we will just barely see gravitational noise from seismic fields. So th this is um, th this is why we really so far have not worried much about that, but uh, it's going to be important. Um, but something else that I can point out here is that, you know, these two predictions, they are different in um, in a simple way because under the test masses, uh, which are suspended and which are just located if, you know, a meter and a half above ground, uh, under these test masses in reality, uh, or, you know, one, the test mass I want to say are suspended about 1.5 meter above ground level. Because in reality, what there is, is under these test masses, there are rooms that are being used to install these test masses from below. So you enter essentially the vacuum chambers from below through a room that is under these test masses. And this, the, the, just the presence of this room is, um, is kind of causing a reduction of the gravitational noise because you have you keep a greater distance between the ground and the test mass. So this is just to say at these higher frequencies, uh, having such rooms, um, uh, you know, under test masses, which you can you know, generally say it's a recess. Uh, with these recesses, you already achieve some interesting uh, noise reduction. At very low frequencies, it's not so effective anymore because it's really uh, the dimension of, the, of this recess relative to the length of the seismic waves, which matters here. Um, also, um, for the acoustic gravitational noise, uh, predictions were made. And in the meantime, actually, the, the, these would have to be corrected because what people at the site did was to reduce the infrastructure noise. So they were, you know, we did analyses. We showed that this acoustic gravitational noise is uh, potentially important. So people went back to the infrastructure, to the ventilation system, and they made modifications of the system, lowering by factor three or something uh, the, the the sound level inside the buildings, which immediately leads to reduction of the gravitational noise. This is just to give you an example. 
you know, if you, um, you, you can do things about your, about your infrastructure to, to uh, so, you know, avoid some of the problem. So for Virgo, um, infrastructure, recesses and noise cancellation, something that I will talk more about later, uh, are the important uh, mitigation methods. Now we also have the Einstein telescope, the next generation infrastructure that uh, we foresee, well, we plan to build underground in Europe. And um, so here the situation is a little bit different because here we are talking about somewhat lower frequencies. So the Einstein telescope, you know, Virgo is kind of seeing down to 10 Hertz at best. With the Einstein telescope, we want to go maybe to two, three Hertz, um, which is uh, really amp amplifying the whole problem with the gravitational noise. And if we build, if we build ET at the surface, then you know, by orders of magnitude, you would be limited at low frequencies by noise from the gravitational background. And there's really no way that you can deal with that you know, at the surface uh, effectively. So for that reason, the, that for this, mainly for this reason, it was decided to build the Einstein telescope underground. And so you achieve some reduction of this gravitational background, depending also on depth, but also on site properties. So these curves here are very sensitive to where you build the detector and what the geology looks like there. But just to give you an idea, um, underground is in principle a, a very effective method to avoid some of this very strong gravitational foreground. So um, for the effective mitigation methods, what I list here is infrastructure design. So for Einstein Telescope, we are now in the situation that we have to plan the infrastructure. And this time, of course, with a lot of um, attention uh, paid to the, to, to the noise makers and the infrastructure to, the, to avoid them from the very beginning underground and noise cancellation. Recess, I don't list here anymore because simply because the, you know, I told you it's about the ratio between the dimension of the recess and the length of seismic waves. At these low frequencies, the waves become so long that you cannot build a recess big enough around the test masses to really avoid um, uh, significantly, at least the gravitational noise produced by seismic fields. Okay, so now um, that said, um, what the gravitation background can look like, I want to uh, talk about noise cancellation because that is for us the systematic standard approach to achieve mitigation of this noise. And the first example I want to give is how that might look like, uh, for example, in Virgo. We um, have been developing in the, for the Virgo detector a noise cancellation system uh, for the gravitational noise, which looks in the following way that we deploy, you know, their test masses here at the two end buildings. And then these two buildings are separated by three kilometers to the central building here. And around each test mass, so we have two test masses here, one at each end building, and then we have two test masses here in the uh, central building. Around each test mass, we are deploying seismometers. So 30 seismometers were deployed uh, at the two, each at the two end buildings, and then 50 at the moment, at least, it might become a bit more uh, here in the central building. Now, these sensors have the purpose to monitor the seismic field. And then <clears throat> you take the data from all of these sensors and you pass it through a linear filter. And then you produce a noise estimate. Of course, it's, the magic is really in this linear fil uh, filter because that one has to be calculated to be optimized for noise cancellation. So you're, so you're getting out a noise estimate, um, essentially noise that is correlated between the uh, seismic field and your gravitation wave data. And then you subtract that noise estimate from your gravitation wave data and you get a clean data stream. In principle, that technique has been used um, for a long time in other, uh, in other simpler uh, scenarios. Now for the gravitational noise, it's just far more complicated because the coupling is not just between a certain point that vibrates, for example, and your gravitational wave data, but it's now entire fields that you have to monitor, which makes it far more complicated. Um, but anyway, in principle, um, we know what to do, but uh, we have to now wait another year um, to see that in work and uh, see, see how it's performing. Now, one aspect which is interesting here is that if you want to monitor your env environmental field, like the seismic field, the, the question, the first question is, where should you place your sensors? And so there's a procedure that we follow, which um, uh, looks as, you know, which looks like this. Uh, first, you deploy some sensors uh, in, uh, around your experiment and you characterize the, the, the field that you're interested in with these sensors. So you have, in, the, in our case, at the Virgo site, we had 
uh, temporary arrays uh, consisting of uh, 30 to 40 sensors around the test masses. We left them there for up to a year, but in reality, you know, you can leave it for, for a month and typically you know everything. And then, you know, with the data, you start to understand the seismic field and you can use the data to optimize, essentially, to calculate the optimal seismometer placement to then predict uh, the best performing noise cancellation system. So there, you know, there's a little bit of technicalities going into this procedure because you have to come up with the, because if you're not able to yet, uh, for, for example, you, you want to do all of this before you actually uh, uh, switch on the experiment. So you want to have a system ready before you switch on the experiment, but this means that you never really observe directly the coupling between ground and your, and your data. Um, and so, uh, for that reason, you need kind of, uh, it's a little bit model dependent way um, that allows you then to optimize the, 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 the sensor array. But anyway, there's a Bayesian method that we uh, develop for this, uh, which can use prior understanding of correlations and which can use data and combine them in an optimal way to get out uh, such an optimal seismometer placement. And that procedure also then allows you to say, for example, I mean, not only where to place the sensors, but also how many you need to achieve a certain um, noise cancellation. Of course, not always keep it in mind, this is uh, somewhat model dependent. And um, then in the end, you come up with a final array configuration at the, for, for these test masses. And this is exactly, more or less exactly what we were then able to deploy now as a final setup at the site, because uh, it's almost that, because in reality, of course, in a the laboratory, there are always constraints. For example, there is some kind of uh, uh, computer rack or something which doesn't allow you to place a sensor there. So you have to be able to modify this slightly. But anyway, this is how it works. Now, um, another study we have done, which uh, was quite uh, interesting, was uh, at the LIGO detector, one of the LIGO detectors, the one in Hanford. And um, here is, so, you know, as, as I said, gravitational noise so far hasn't played a role yet. And um, however, of course, it's in the data. The gravitational noise is still the data, but as a sub, um, you know, dominant contribution to the, uh, to, to a minor contribution to, to, the, to the noise. Um, but since it's there, you might try to um, detect it. Uh, but what it needs is essentially long correlation time. So what you, what you can do is if you have a seismometer array deployed around test masses, and now you take the data from these seismometers and you take the data from your experiment, you know, the gravitational wave data, and then you correlate these um, time series for long periods of time. And now I'm, I really talk about months, like, you know, you have continuous data for a couple of months, let's say, and you make some pre-selection to remove like bad uh, noisy times and so on. But at, at the end of the day, with a lot of data, you can even identify noise that is maybe a factor 100 even weaker than the noise that actually limits your sensitivity at some point. So, and this is what we have done. We had this array here at the corner station of one of the LIGO detectors. And then we correlated this data with the, um, with the gravitational wave data. So there was uh, the, the, the red spectrum here was a noise spectrum uh, at that time, which was a LIGO second uh, science run. So it's uh, quite some time ago. Um, and we were then able to dig into this noise and try to identify parts which are correlated with ground motion. And we found these, and uh, we found these actually with quite high statistical significance. That means like the, the statistical uh, sensitivity limit to this correlation analysis was more than an order of magnitude below the noise that we identified. So this was a very clear uh, trace that uh, ground motion left in the data uh, especially at lower frequencies around 10 Hertz, we had like uh, bands where there was a lot of ground noise. So <clears throat> in principle, this is noise that you could subtract from your gravitation wave data. Of course, we didn't have to at that time because it was a minor contribution overall. But in the future, if that noise were still there in the future, then we, we would be able to subtract it with uh, that array. Um, okay. And by the way, we don't really care, of course, um, what that noise is. We don't know if that, I should point out, we don't know if, really, if that is really gravitational noise 
or if that is produced by some other coupling between ground and gravitational wave data, because there are uh, many possible ways ground motion can couple with gravitational wave data. And so we don't really know the origin of that noise, but whatever it is, we would be able to subtract it. Okay, so in the Einstein telescope, the whole thing becomes more complicated and it has to do with low frequencies. So um, at low frequencies, the of, of course, generally it is true that the coupling between you know a gravitational wave detector and the environment becomes stronger towards lower frequencies. So um, that means your effort to to mitigate noise becomes um, um, more and more complicated when you go to lower frequencies. And for the Einstein telescope, of course, as I said, most of 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 the reduction is achieved just by going underground. But it turns out that. Uh, the, uh, it, at least according to current estimates, um, it seems that there will still be some gravitational noise in the data that will limit the sensitivity. Um, at least, you know, uh, com, um, you know, relative to the sensitivity target that we that 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 we want to achieve, and so we still have to plan some gravitational noise uh, subtraction. And now the problem is if you're underground, then what dominates really the, the seismic gravitational background are the, um, the body waves of the seismic field. That means waves that can propagate in all directions that are not bound to the, to the surface. And so uh, the, uh, the only way to monitor these effectively and do cancellation of that noise is to deploy borehole arrays. And this, it's interesting because these borehole arrays are extremely expensive. Um, you know, uh, a conservative estimate, let's say, points us towards 150 million just for that installation of these sensors to then achieve a factor two or three suppression of gravitational noise. So that's a huge cost. Um, and uh, you want to do it right. So there are ways to actually save the cost, and we're working on this, but let's focus on this problem. So since that's such a costly uh, um, experiment to do or, or system to, to prepare, uh, you have to be very good in how you, um, you know, your understanding of the site and your modeling of the seismic fields and so on and so forth. It requires a very detailed um, characterization of your site to then be able to design that system at, you know, and install it at minimal cost. Um, and so this is, um, what we're working on, and uh, I'm already at uh, my last slide. So the um, essentially, you have to here really make use of a Bayesian approach for this um, uh, system design. So um, just to say we have currently for the Einstein telescope two candidate sites, and we haven't chosen yet. I think that we still have to wait a couple of years for that. And one of these sites in Sardinia, and since you know I'm, I'm mostly involved in the characterization of that site, and um, what we have done is essentially the, the problem is the following. So what, you know, at Virgo, for example, to characterize the seismic field, it was just enough to, you know, deploy 40 sensors. We had then such, we had a, a, a lot of seismic data to look at and to understand the seismic field. There was no reason to really put into this process uh, priors really. We, we used very uh, um, um, uh, primitive priors for our Bayesian uh, uh, modeling and, and optimization. But uh, when, when you talk about Einstein Telescope, where you do not have easy access to underground seismic data because that is already very expensive to, to obtain, then your modeling skills and uh, providing priors to an optimization um, routine is far more important. And so we have started to set up finite element modeling, uh, taking into account the, the topography and geology of the site. Um, use that to really um, predict gravitational coupling between seismic fields and underground test masses. And um, based on that, in the end, um, you, you, at, at some point, the, the, the seismic data will come in from the measurement campaigns, and you put this then together, um, essentially, to, to construct, uh, for example, through Gaussian process regression, um, a surrogate filter, a surrogate um, model, essentially, um, of the of the noise cancellation filter, this is what what technically it is, and then you use that essentially to calculate the optimal um, uh, sensor locations um, to to do the cancellation. 
So this is just to say, you know, that, that we have this generic approach of noise cancellation, but sometimes um, because of the cost, you really have to, um, you do not have the option just to say, okay, we will deploy sensors to do it. Uh, you really have to uh, do analysis very carefully to come up with an efficient design. And, uh, um, and yeah, that's basically the, the end of my talk. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jan. Really, um, really nice talk. And uh, I guess we have about five minutes for questions. So, uh, Mark, you have your hand up. I don't know if that's an artifact or real. <laughs> that's an artifact from before. I guess. <laughs> All right, so then uh, Anubhav has his hand up. So. Hi, Jan. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for this fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it. So the question is that uh, how deep do you have to go? I mean, that uh, I mean, it perhaps it will also um, ameliorate some of your uh, gravity gradient noises, which you're talking about. So is there any optimal, uh, you know, depth would you, rec uh, would you recommend? Because you are one of the experts in this field. So you have. Yeah. Um, generally, the, your, the answer to that question depends on the interesting frequency band. Um, so, you know, for, for Einstein telescope, it's definitely enough to go a few hundred meters underground. Um, if you want to push to somewhat low frequencies in Einstein telescope with, with, with measurements, then uh, you would have to go deeper underground. But in reality, you know, at some point, you're not getting that much. I mean, you, you can see some of that really. Um, from the fact that the, the body wave seismic gravitation background, which, which um, represents the underground background, which you cannot avoid. So this, this red spectrum here, you cannot um, avoid, you, you, you know, even like a 10 kilometer underground, you would still see that red background here because it's, it's, by, it's made by the body waves which are present everywhere on earth. Um, what you can avoid by going underground is this orange uh, spectrum here. And what, what you can see is that essentially there is no advantage except for maybe higher frequencies because um, you have uh, weather phenomena and, and human activity, uh, things like that, which can produce excess noise. So this is uh, one way, you, you know, at here at a few hertz and above, you can avoid really noise substantially by going underground. And then interestingly, at low frequencies also a little bit, which is connected to excess ground motion, which is produced by forcing of the atmosphere um, through pressure gradients, essentially. So again, pressure gradients can start to push a little bit on the ground, which produces, uh, but this is, this is nothing that propagates deep into the ground. It's a superficial effect, which is by direct forcing. And so this you can also avoid, but here again, just a few hundred, you know, 100 meter in reality is already enough to completely avoid this excess noise at low frequency. But beyond that, there's not much you can gain by going underground. Or deep underground. If, if you want to go for, if you have your uh, apparatus, which is roughly uh, uh, 10 raised to minus one hertz, and you want to get rid of the acceleration noise, which is 10 raised to minus 18, then uh, then how how deep do you have to go? Because this this plot you are showing is for a given depth, I guess. Yeah, but uh, so this red curve, you know, this red curve would be measured as gravitational noise at any depth. Okay. So yeah, there's, you know, if you want to get at this frequency, 10 minus 18, then you would have to do noise cancellation essentially, or you better go into space. Thanks. Yeah, um, very good. So I think maybe we have one more question than Peter Barker. Uh, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Um, so can you, so you talked about that, you know, you take this, uh, this, you have many sensors and you take this data for several months and then you subtract off a background. So is that is that a background that you subtract off sort of in frequency space that's averaged over all time, or is it you know is it a temporal subtraction? I mean, so, and if and if you have you know a signal that's changing in time, how do you know that? Well, how does it work basically? Yeah. So we uh, um, in in some in some sense the 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 goal of the subtraction is to do a, a, an average reduction of of noise in, in some band, but uh, how we apply it is in the end through time domain. What I explained on this slide about the long correlation times that was peculiar to this problem because we had to identify a very weak contribution in the noise. In reality, you know, once that noise becomes dominant, 
you don't need this uh, these long averaging times. So you can even do uh, adaptive filtering and uh, continuously optimize your noise cancellation. For example, if you have some slow drifts in your fields, um, seismic sources might change over time and stuff like that. So essentially your filter uh, can adapt to these changes and you don't need long averaging times to have anything efficient. But the way uh, we, we in our detectors, we have to do this in time domain because all the analyses are carried out on time series data. Uh, there are only very few um, analyses that we actually do in frequency domain. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so thanks, Jan. I think we had better keep it moving to stay on schedule. So, um, but I would encourage a longer discussion about some of this later. So, uh, next speaker is Klaus Lemmerzell, who hopefully can share a screen. Yes, I'm trying. Good. So, okay. Excellent. You can see it. I'll just give you a five minute warning before the end of yeah, it. Okay, fun. thank you. So I'll make it full screen. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm talking uh, uh, about hypothetical space time fluctuations and the, and the influence on, on quantum systems in general here. <clears throat> so I first go to, to what one can expect from quantum gravity and then uh, go to classical systems, quantum systems, and also optical systems, and then I make a summary. So uh, the uh, standard model of, of physics today is mainly based on the Einstein equivalence principle. So we have the, this consists of the universality of free fall, it's the universality of the gravitational redshift and Lorentz lower and, and local Lorentz invariance. And from that one can determine how the equations of uh, the equations of motion for for the matter looks looks like. So one can derive the geodesic equation, the Maxwell equation, the Dirac equation. And um, one observable from that or what one observes is that in these equations there are all in similar coefficients and these coefficients then uh, combine to the space-time metric. Yeah? A, a, a consequence of the Einstein equivalence principle is that the uh, space-time is of Riemannian type and this, uh, this space-time metric then enters all, all these, um, these equations of motion. And uh, the, the other point one needs is then to have a, an equation of motion for or, yeah, an equation for the space-time metric. And then this is uh, given by, by the Einstein field equation. Uh, there's no, no strict mathematical derivation of that, but all the experiments uh, using PPN formalism also uh, show that the uh, Einstein's GR is really very well tested. And, um, and uh, uh, at the moment, exactly and, and uh, correctly describes all the gravitational phenomena um, we are observing. However, we know that this picture cannot be complete. We have the, uh, the structure of today's theory is that we have this frame series, which are valid for everything we are doing, this quantum series, special relativity, general relativity, and statistical mechanics. And we have the four interactions, you know, and then we have the problems of the incompatibility of quantum theory, general rel relativity, for example, problem of time, the singularities. And then, well, of course, we also have the wish to unify all the interactions. Yeah? So, and, and the, the uh, ultimate ga uh, goal would be to have a solution for all this here. Um, since these series are not compatible, yeah, this means then that the, our standard series cannot be true um, in, in total. And, and so they, there should be some deviations from the fundamental principles, that is, the deviations from the Einstein equivalence principle. And this requires for more precise tests. So if we have a deviation from, from, from a standard physics, you have to modify standard physics. And this can be done, for example, in uh, deviations from the standard Maxwell equations, the standard Dirac equation, or the Einstein equation. This then necessarily would need to violation of the Einstein equivalence principle. And this means that we have to search for violations of the Einstein equivalence principle. This is, this is one prominent way to search for 
possible effects of the generalization of the, of the pre uh, present uh, state physics. We also may, this is, these are the modifications of the, on the effective level or more on the classical level. We also may look on the quantum level. So uh, we may ask for modified notions of space time itself. That is, for example, space time fluctuations. But how we do explore these fluctuations, of course, again, by particles, photons, and quantum systems and classical systems. And again, this would show up as, as here in, in, in deviations from the geodesic equation or in, 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 in deviations from the Einstein equivalence principle. But there also might be other issues like fundamental noise which uh, might somehow be decoupled from, from this classical tests or degrees, non-conserved probability, for example, or entanglement issues. Um, and, and this is what is uh, discussed here, uh, for example, by Anupam and this morning by Carlo. Um, so what, what could be, and, and these fluctuations are now the topic of this uh, short talk and uh, what, how these fluctuations may come in. One can may fluctuate on the level of the metric on the connection. Uh, that means uh, all the torsion and non-metricity non involved there on curvature, or one may look at the, at the manifold itself, uh, granularity of the, of the, of the space-time. And um, consequences of that might be, for example, higher order derivatives in the, in the field equations or non-linearities, non-Hermitian terms, uh, time-dependent constants, modified Newton or Kuhner laws, and so on and so on. Um, and how one could observe this with, uh, with interferometers, cavities, atomic interferometers, atoms with spin, bound, bound, bound quantum system and um, and this uh, should of course um, yeah um, we should uh, make data analysis of all the existing data with respect to these uh, questions whether there are some some fundamental noise of fluctuation present in the in the data and of course um, and uh, the question is what are the characteristics of this noise or could be the characteristics of the noise of the fluctuations and the, um, the, the point here is that uh, all these fluctuations should influence all the matter systems. Yeah? There should be a universality of the, of the fluctuations in their um, effects on, on interferometry, on cavities, on atoms, and, and spin, and so on, and so on, because um, the uh, geometry is the coupling to all these uh, these, uh, these uh, material systems. And therefore, um, in, in order to really identify uh, space-time fluctuations, one has to observe this in uh, many or at least two, two um, independent um, material systems, uh, for example, in photons or in electrons or atoms and so on. Um, yeah, this are the, so to say the overall system. So we have all these uh, these consequences, and then we can check the photon sector and the matter sector, and and that is what we are going to do now. Uh, there are some history on this uh, space-time fluctuations. Uh, it goes back to Hawking, Bekenstein, Wheeler, and so on. And 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 I think the first. Uh, um, analysis of of the metrical fluctuations uh, uh, with experiment comes from. Ellis, George, uh, John Ellis and co-workers who analyzed the, uh, the, 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 the decoherence effects on a, on a neutron interferometry due to a fluctuating metric. Then there was modified Schrodinger equations and, um, and also there was a, a, a large amount of papers on, on the bacon fluctuations leading to modified inertia. Um, also, this uh, this uh, primary primary state diffusion uh, this discussion in the early two two uh, two thousands. Then uh, there was a proposal by Amelino Camellia on on um, on the gravitation on the space time fluctuations, uh, which are which uh, end up with a Brownian motion effects in the in the material systems. 
then there was uh, Ng and Van Damme uh, discussing the Zareka Wigner uh, argument and also introducing holo the holographic principle. Uh, Hugh Verdager did uh, um, many things on, on uh, non-fluctuation thought, uh, discussed mainly the uh, effects on light, the blurring of light, uh, which, uh, which, which might be seen in the sky, and also the, uh, the effects on, on, uh, on geodesic deviation. Um, uh, there are also relations to, the, to a modified dispersion relation, or the conformal fluctuations in, in, the, in the British group. And then there was this discussion on the holographic noise, and then also uh, influence of, on the lamp shift and hyperfine structures, that is uh, influence on, on bound, uh, on, on bound um, uh, systems, and also something on, on, the, on fluctuations to create entanglement. Okay, now I will make here a few examples here. Um, first on the classical level, I have uh, here a certain approach which uh, comes from the from, uh, from higher order equations of motion. So if you have a, a framework with, uh, with fourth order differential equation for the, as a, as the equation of motion, and if we couple this to, um, to, to some a, a, According to a neutral principle or to the gauge principle, then we have uh, we have two gauge fields here. We, we, we need that in order to to describe how how external forces can act on these on these objects. And the um, the most simple uh, realization of that is the pius uhlenbeck oscillator. And we have here the additional quantity epsilon, which is now the deviation from the classical equation of motion from from the uh, from the third Newtonian axiom, um, here we, uh, and and the epsilon is is a, is what we allow, uh, like to see here, and and the dimension is of is of the order kilogram times second squared squared. If we take here Planck scales, yeah, if if we take a realization of this units by Planck units, then it's um, ten to minus ninety five, so it's very very small, and by uh, at atomic system it's uh, ten to minus seventy one. And now, if you have the most simple equation of motion based on this model, this is given by the constant electric force here. Uh, and, and here we have this, uh, this additional term, the force time derivative of the, of the position. We make the most simple initial condition and then, ca then calculate this, the solution. We have a small deviation from the standard law for the position, for the velocity. For the acceleration, it is it is um, of the the, uh, the modification is of order of unity, and for the jerk, it is it is large. Yeah? And this here on this level, it is something like a zitter bewegung, and uh, and um, uh, as I told, the limit exists here for for uh, only for x and x dot dot. But this is what what we are usually measuring. And how we can test this epsilon and in, in influence on, on this epsilon. So this is by, by measuring time of flight uh, of accelerated charged bodies and, and the time of flight may, may fluctuate. And then this would give you a, a deviation formula here, which depends on epsilon. Or if you do atom interferometric um, measurements, um, then this is uh, this is given by this phase shift here with this uh, transfer function. And with this transfer function, one may uh, again see the epsilon, which is apparent in this uh, in the acceleration. Or we may observe the sitter bewegung of a charged particle um, inside um, an, um, an capacitor here, um, and this then would would induce um, a um, a noise in this, a voltage noise in this electrical circuit, and, and this is uh, again related to the to the epsilon. If we take all these uh, three three um, experiments, just as uh, taking their usual accuracy there, then one would get an estimate of ten to minus fifty. This is still far away from the quantum gravity level, but uh, there are not yet any dedicated experiments on that. One may ask whether gravitational wave interferometers are more sensitive to a, to a such kind of fluctuations. 
And uh, just a remark, higher derivatives are also used in mathematics to uh, analyze um, differential equations. And this is uh, related to a violation of the Newton's third axiom, that is, this, uh, this force is equal to the momentum, uh, the time derivative of the momentum. Higher order in time derivatives just gives a small energy shift, so it also has been discussed by us. So this is uh, on, on, this, uh, on the classical level. On the quantum level, we are starting with the Klein-Gordon equation coupled to a metric in, in the usual way. Then we assume a fluctuating metric, a fluctuating metric with a, with a small h mu nu. And we assume that the, um, that the average of this metric gives some gamma and the, and the square of the average also some, some, uh, some uh, deviation here. So we are uh, we assuming, of course, small amplitudes. Um, the frequency might be large, uh, but we are not using any, any, any equation of motion for the fluctuations. And this are uh, always here space-time averaging. One can, um, we, have, uh, we have to, uh, um, we have to uh, make, the make the approximation up to second order in order to see any, any secular effects. So the, uh, all the tilde effects are, secular, are quadratic in the, in the metric fluctuations. And then we can derive from this uh, Klein-Gordon equation an effective uh, uh, Schrödinger equation with a, with a correct Laplace Beltami op operator and some additional terms here. And only these, uh, these uh, quadratic terms do not vanish by further averaging here. And this is what we are doing now. We are, we are now averaging. I don't know whether I should uh, go into detail because time is running. So we are, we are averaging, uh, have, have this next averaging here, these, uh, these uh, Hamilton equation or Schrodinger equation. This is deviation from the, from the Kronecker delta here. This uh, alpha is just uh, this. Uh, this, uh, this quadratic part here. And now we can decompose this alpha into a, a, a secular part and the part which, uh, which uh, is, uh, is uh, so that, uh, which vanishes in, in, a, in time averaging. And this, this acts as an anomalous inertial mass tensor. One can now introduce some uh, spectral noise density for this, uh, since this is related to the to, to this fluctuations. We can replace the fluctuations by the spectral noise density, make some power law ansatz, and then can derive how this alpha depends on uh, on the length on on the length scale of the of the quantum object. Um, um, we are, uh, 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 but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, and, uh, and uh, here in, in order to make a contact to the, to the quantum gravity scale, the other length here, which is, which is in the game, is then will be related to the Planck's length. So that we have here the ratio of the Planck length and the, and the, and the, and the quantum system length scale is some exp exponential part here and the effective, effective Hamiltonian then looks like that. So this is then like, acts like an anomalous inertial mass tensor and would depend on the mass or on the properties of the particles. We will not speak of the masses. So this is just the characteristic length like the Compton length or, or the geometric, uh, uh, the geometric ex extension of the particle. And, and we may identify beta equal one half as random walk uh, or beta equal two third as holographic noise. Then we can derive the, uh, the, um, the free fall of this, uh, of these quantum particles, which can be measured, measured by atom interferometry. This would then lead to, a, to an apparent violation of the university of free fall. And if one calculates the Eötvös parameter for beta equal one, it's uh, very small, but for holographic noise, it might be in the reach for, for next generation atom interferometers. And uh, this is um, not far away from the, from the present uh, interferometers. Um, okay, I'll skip this. Uh, one also can uh, Discuss here the decoherence, which is here encoded in the time-dependent part of this of this um, correction term here, 
we neglect here the alpha. So this has already been discussed and just discussed the uh, fluctuating gamma ij. Yeah, as you know, isotropic fluctuations, white noise, and the dimension of this uh, this sigma is a is a time uh, is a time constant, um, and we can now uh, derive from that we we uh, go into the interaction picture and uh, and average the density matrix over all the fluctuations, and for this average density matrix we can derive a um, a master equation, uh, an equation for the time dependence on of this density matrix. And in the Schrodinger picture, we get uh, here a, a nice, um, uh, a, a nice um, equation of motion with this operator. And this master equation is uh, nicely in the Lindblad form so uh, that it is uh, really behaving very well in, the, in, in this quantum context. And uh, uh, D is called the dissipator. And if we calculate, if we solve that, then we get we can calculate the, the, the decoherence time, which unfortunately for the characteristic uh, time scale for the for the fluctuations of the Planck time is uh, very large. So that this is not yet um, available uh, or accessible by by uh, quantum systems might be that this will change if you recalculate this for both the Einstein condensates. What also what can be also done is we can calculate the um, um, the spreading of the wave packet in in the way that we take here the correlation function here the Gaussian random function for this uh, potential here, which is uh, of the order of the of the square of the uh, space time fluctuations. And from that one can calculate the free, uh, so the usual um, spreading of the wave packet, but uh, packet, but there's also a super diffusion part here, and A is a is a wave packet bit. So this can all the, uh, these are all all the effects on on uh, isolated quantum systems. One also may discuss uh, space time fluctuations on, uh, on uh, optical systems, that is on cavities. So here are some, uh, some types of, uh, of cavities where light is going back and forth inside, and this uh, considers a cavity. Um, here we relied on, uh, on the, um, on the uh, space time fluctuation uh, spectral noise uh, given by uh, Giovanni uh, here, in, in, uh, where he, he has the uh, frequency part of the of the uh, fluctuations, and here is the length scale of the of the physical system. And um, uh, we started in uh, this is now in now an experimental work. So we uh, we have started here the these uh, 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 first is the beta equal one, and uh, or this these uh, beta one and minus two and two and minus two. This uh, this a random work scenario one and then random random walk scenario one and random walk scenario two, um, and uh, uh, these are so, so to say these uh, coefficients which come up from from uh, this ansatz if we take theta to be of the order. yeah theta is is a is a given here and and the theta of course should be of the order one. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is what is estimate which comes from from comparison with uh, with um, with uh, with experiments? And so what we did is we we take data from from cryogenic optical resonators um, and uh, measured uh, the comparison of the of the frequency of these two to uh, um, resonators by taking into account beside all these uh, physical uh, fluctuations and the log fluctuations and other fluctuations. All this is a space time fluctuations um, part into account. And uh, from this data, and the data are given here by the setup B and setup A. A is a, are two, two cavities parallel in, in the different uh, cryogenic systems, and the B are two cavities orthogonal in one cryogenic system. And uh, so from this, we got this uh, I and the double I curves for this, um, 
for these uh, 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 frequency dependencies of mu to minus two and mu to minus one. And uh, from this curves here, which are, so to say, the, the lower bound of this of this measurements, one can then derive that the random work, uh, random walk coefficient here is 10 to minus, should be 10 to minus 13, and here 10, 10 to 20. And so this is here, uh, this uh, rules out the, um, the, uh, the random walk hypothesis one, that is here with, uh, with, uh, with beta equal one. And um, um, this we have published a few years ago here. And, and what also should be done, we have not done this to, uh, to do this for, for, the, for the holographic noise part that is uh, beta equal um, uh, to, to third. And, 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 for the, uh, and, and for this is we also get here at 10 to minus 33. So we still have to further analyze that. So this is um, what I told to you. So we have fluctuations in uh, which, so, we expect, of course, quantum gravity signals. We do not know really the scale. And um, uh, here we discussed more or less, or, or mostly the extreme low energy regime. You, sometimes one is uh, looking for high energy um, uh, protons, photons, and so on in, uh, in, in the cosmological context and, and, and studies the, the dispersion relation. Here we are discussing the extreme low energy part. and. Um, and to discuss the, the influence of space-time fluctuations on classical systems, on cold atoms, mainly on cold atoms, and also on photonic systems. And um, yeah, what what should be done is to uh, also to discuss the spin, who couples, which couples on on the curvature, really to discuss the, the fluctuations acting on all the Einstein condensates, and also. Yeah, if one is doing an ex experiment, it would be nice also to this to analyze the data with respect to this, such, such kind of models. So with this, I thank you very much. Thanks, Klaus. So um, we have about three minutes. If anybody has a quick question, uh, just raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Anupam? Thanks, Klaus, for, uh, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, so, um, so essentially, my question is that because uh, you have been involved in uh, this um, space in ISS for the BEC, and um, in ISS, as, as I think you have once told me that it's, uh, the, the, you cannot really get rid of the local acceleration. So what is the gravity gradient noise? How much is the contribution coming from the gravi gravity gradient noise for any of these experiments in ISS? Uh, the uh, um, I, I really don't know the numbers, but, but, but the, uh, the acceleration noise is of, the, is of the order 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 6 or so. What is the gravity gradi gradient noise? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, one should calculate that. So, I so the question would would that not be affect your um, outcome as well in 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 uh, you know phase phase measurement and things like that? Yes, yes, of course. This would uh, influence so, so uh, any any uh, change in the potential influences the uh, dynamics of uh, of quantum systems, and, and so you will uh, see. Uh, um, yeah, different um, effects, um, uh, change, change of the of the of the spreading of the wave packet also. Um, so if if this is really the, from 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 this um, uh, one, one also has to look whether whether this are are um, quasi static fluctuations. So um, uh, um, uh, fluctuations which are more on the on the spatial level or whether there's are time time dependent fluctuations so far I think this uh, this um, the um, on the international space station on the Inter international space station the um, the time dependence is very uh, small yeah? so, so this is a system which is uh, let's say a few seconds or so os oscillating back and forth so so that there will be no no big influence on 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 any quantum system yeah? but but the uh, 
but the uh, static gravity gradient might 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 play a role. Yeah. So 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 we in the drop tower we have some some issues on the on 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 the remaining gravity gradient and also on 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 rotations. Yeah. So the the, the, the rotations are also an an issue. And um, this I have not discussed here. Or this has somehow included in this in this H H mu nu. But uh, in principle, one not only should discuss um, accelerations, but also rotations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how about, uh, say, for instance, experiments like Lisa and going to the Lagrange point? Is there any? I mean, of course, it's very expensive experiment. I mean, if you ever think about doing such experiment, but with, uh, so with the Lisa, uh, our Pathfinder has done some analysis for their case. Yeah, they have. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. They have made made this analysis or made made their own analysis, uh, describing their their their, um, their um, performance uh, in 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 terms of the spectral noise density. Also, this uh, grace grace follow on. The, the, this uh, system also made made very nice analysis. Um, so I think they are. Uh, oh, I've forgotten the number. I think this is something like ten to minus fourteen meter per second square per square root of hertz, or something like that, or or ten to minus twelve or so. Yeah. So so in in the space, you are of course uh, you have the uh, optimal conditions, of course. Yeah. Surely. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thanks. And. Um... Yeah, I think Lisa Pathfinder was 10 to negative 15 meters per second squared per root. It's, it's really like an insane, insanely precise experiment. So, um, uh, but yeah, so thanks, Klaus. And then we'll move on to uh, Catherine Zurich, who will give a not totally unrelated talk, I believe. Hello. Share. Hi, Catherine. So let's. Share my screen. All right. All right, so can you see my mouse? Yeah, I can see your mouse. All right. All right, so should I go ahead and get started? Yeah, please, sorry. I'll give you a five minute warning at that. Okay, all right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, Anna Palm and the organizers um, for the invitation to give this talk. So I'm gonna talk about uh, these three papers, the first two were with um, Eric Verlinde uh, and the third one, which appeared recently, um, which is the result of a long <laughs> series of thoughts, uh, taking a relatively conservative approach to the question of whether uh, fluctuations, space-time fluctuations are observable in quantum gravity. So I'm gonna be able to race through, uh, let's see, can I go to the next? Why can I not? There we go. So I'll be able to race through these first few slides. So you're well familiar that you know the conventional wisdom is that fluctuations in quantum gravity aren't observable. And there's a good reason for this, that if I do an, a power law expansion in the gravitational potential, that if I take G Newton as the expansion parameter, then generically you would expect quantum effects to enter at Planck length squared. Um, and of course, that's not observable. Uh, and so all the work that I've done and really uh, anyone has done in this area focuses on the fact that there's a natural IR scale, which is the measurement scale in the experiment. So as I said before, I'm taking a fairly conservative approach, which is that I want to leverage the theoretical progress, which has mostly been in the context of ADSC T but also more recently um, S SYK model, JT gravity, uh, that are understanding how non-locality and entanglement play an important role in quantum gravity. 
And we're learning as a result of that, that some of the standard EFT reasoning and intuition breaks down when it comes to space time. So the simplest way to think about this is that within the context of effective field theory, uh, it vastly overcounts the degrees of freedom in a space time volume, um, which we believe uh, should actually be set by the area of some entangling surface between the volume that you're measuring and what's not being measured. And so as a result, we expect that there's gonna be some type of non-locality or long range correlations in the space-time fluctuations. And so the approach that um, I've been taking is to try to leverage all of this theoretical progress, mainstream theoretical progress to understand whether it seems uh, reasonable based on what is emerging of our understanding of quantum gravity that these space-time fluctuations would be observable. So let me tell you about what precisely is our effect. So it's very simple. So we know that the vacuum energy fluctuates. Um, now, when I integrate over all space time, of course, the vacuum energy has to vanish, but any experiment is gonna be making a measurement over a finite space time volume. Uh, and so um, what's going to happen is that in that space time volume, as the energy is fluctuating, that's going to induce metric fluctuations. And those metric fluctuations give rise to length fluctuations. So this is a very generic idea. This should be an infrared effect because it depends on the size of the space-time volume that you're measuring. The question is how precisely does it enter? So, um, so in order to, to make use of the uh, theoretical results, what we do is to recast the interferometer as a causal diamond, which of course it is. I have a signal beam and a reference beam. Um, throughout this talk, I'm only gonna be talking about length fluctuations in one beam. Uh, as time goes on and we get better control over the theory, we'll be able to more precisely correlate these. I'll talk about later on what, how we think this is going to behave. And then uh, the world lines of the two mirrors uh, are just here as the dashed lines. And then of course, a beam uh, traces out a causal diamond when it goes from the beam splitter to the far mirror and back. So what we're looking to do is to correlate space-time fluctuations in different causal diamonds and to make a measurement of that within a interferometer. Now, as you well know, the typical size of the effect that's measurable is the geometric mean of the Planck length with the interferometer uh, size. Now, uh, this I think has, has already been discussed today. This uh, effect, which also arises from a kind of random walk intuition, has some issues with observational constraints. So for example, if they're not correlated in the angular directions, you destroy the images of stars that you measure across the universe. So that's a problem and why this type of a fluctuation, if it's just worked out in the naive way, uh, is actually ruled out by many orders of magnitude. So we are going to ultimately find that this amplitude of the effect may be reasonable within the context of these uh, modular energy fluctuations. But an important distinction is that we find very strong angular correlations. So I'll talk, and that actually implies that, that the images of distant stars are not, are not destroyed. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So let me try to be more specific. So when I write down equations, uh, you'll see things like CFT appearing. And the reason for that is I'm trying to be as precise as I can. So the vacuum fluctuates. So the energy vanishes when you integrate over all space in the, in the vacuum. So if I um, define the modular Hamiltonian uh, within the context of a CFT, I'm gonna argue later on that I actually expect this to apply as well to infrared properties of gravity. Uh, I have the stress tensor of the CFT, which is contracted with a space-time volume element in the uh, a killing vector. And of course, when I take this and compute its expectation value in the, in the vacuum space, when I'm integrating over in all of space time, it vanishes. But of course, the stress tensor itself still has a non-trivial two-point function. Okay. 
So if instead of integrating this over all of space time, I take the measurement volume, in general, I expect uh, that to this quantity not to vanish. So that's uh, part of the essence of the argument is to compute the size of those fluctuations using known tools and then to compute the back reaction on those energy fluctuations um, to see whether they would be observable or not. So the outline of the remainder of this talk is I'm going to review arguments from our first uh, paper um, where we postulate the size of the energy fluctuations in the Minkowski vacuum based on the holographic principle. And then we compute the resultant length fluctuations by doing a foliation of the causal diamond as a topological black hole. Then I'm going to go to a more theoretically controlled setting, which is ADS-CFT, where there's just no question about what's going on. I don't have to postulate anything. I just sit down and calculate. And we find the same features uh, as we did for Minkowski space. So um, because the effect is so large, I think it's helpful to think about an effective field theory based model. Um, this is a model. So this I would call perhaps the most speculative um, part of this whole uh, discussion. But this effective field theory based model, uh, I'm gonna, I call the Pixelon. So what is our argument? There are three easy or not so easy steps. So the first uh, is to calculate the fluctuations and the energy of the vacuum. So in ADS-CFT, there are no assumptions involved. In Minkowski space, you make a postulate. It is, of course, a testable postulate that the same relations hold between the entropy and energy fluctuations. Then you compute the back reaction of the metric on this energy fluctuation and finally convert that into a length fluctuation. So let's see how this works first within the context of Minkowski space. So as I said before, the interferometer traces out a causal diamond. So if I imagine my beam splitter, I choose a coordinate system where my beam splitter is at the center of a, a sphere, spherical symmetry for convenience of calculation. And the arms go out to some point, which this is going to be the entangling surface. And then they come back that defines a, a horizon, a horizon being the surface which separates the region that I have measured from the region that I have not, the space-time volume that has been measured versus the one that has not been. Now here we make an assumption, which is that there is an entropy associated with that horizon, okay? and that, that entropy is precisely the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Okay? Now, in the context of ADS-CFT, I'm going to be able to calculate this uh, from the Ryutaki Nagi conjecture, okay, um, and uh, and we'll find exactly this result. Now, once I have this entropy, which I'm going to associate with degrees of freedom, the space-time degrees of freedom that are active in this volume, then what I do is go ahead and compute thermodynamically, similar to the way that you would in ADS-CFT the fluctuations in the thermodynamic quantities. So there's a free energy associated with this horizon entropy. And then as a result, there's a, um, a, a partition function and I can compute from that free energy, the mass fluctuations associated with this entropy with the horizon temperature being set by one on the length scale of uh, the, the volume that I'm measuring. And these mass fluctuations are Planckian mass fluctuations. Maybe not that surprising. So then you can compute a gravitational potential. I'm going to tell you what precisely this gravitational potential is on the next slide, uh, which depends on uh, these mass fluctuations. And this gravitational potential is, is tiny. So let me tell you about that gravitational potential. So another fact, uh, important fact, is that if I choose to restrict myself to a causal diamond, so this, I can make a metric transformation from ordinary light cone coordinates, say U and V, which is the difference between, let's say, one direction, R minus T and R plus T, those define U and V. I can make a transformation from those light cone coordinates to a coordinate system which depends on here capital R, 
And uh, it's rather unfortunate that somehow uh, the, um, uh, I didn't write down the entire metric, but the entire metric looks like uh, the usual black hole metric, except there's no black hole. <laughs> this is simply a coordinate transformation where the form of the, uh, of the, the metric um, looks like a black hole metric with this blackening factor. Okay, so an ADS, it's a little bit different form of F of R, it's one minus R squared on L squared. It turns out that in Minkowski space, the correct transformation from light cone coordinates to these topological black hole coordinates is one minus a linear combination R on L. Then, uh, so in the vacuum, then uh, there, uh, this, this coordinate system is singular, singular at R is equal to L. But uh, there is also uh, a metric uh, contribution here that allows for metric fluctuations due to these mass fluctuations. Now, what you can see is that any fluctuation in the position of this horizon at R is equal to L implies it goes like uh, a product of these metric fluctuations, HUU times HVB. And so parametrically, we expect that to scale like delta L squared. Now this relation here, that the, uh, this uh, metric fluctuation, which goes like L plank on L, is quadratic in the length fluctuations. This is the most non-trivial part of the argument. I wanna highlight it. You get an additional square root, okay? So the length fluctuation as a result, because this potential goes like L plank, one power of L plank goes like the square root. So I'll give you one more uh, um, important feature of this, which is that this effect is fundamentally infrared. So this, even though the amplitude of this fluctuation, of these fluctuations are what you would expect from a simple random walk argument, there's an important difference that, the, uh, that these behave like waves whose amplitude is largest for the L equals zero partial wave. So I've picked out a coordinate system uh, because of the configuration of the interferometer, which is spherical with the beam splitter at the center of the sphere. We expect the angular directions, and this is actually very similar to the tough shock waves, that depends on the green function of the uh, transverse directions. So if we're in 4D Minkowski space, uh, we expect that green's function to, uh, to solve this equation. And that green function uh, depends on uh, you know, YLMs, as you would expect, and then it's weighted by L squared plus L plus one. Okay, this incidentally is the same effect as the Tuff shock wave. The difference is that the amplitude of the effect is parametrically enhanced by a factor of the square root of the entropy. And so as a result, you can see that the largest amplitude of this effect is gonna be in the L equals zero mode. Okay, so if I'm looking at some distant object on the sky, astrophysical object, that's going to be a very high L measurement. Um, and you're going to get no observable effect. There's no blurring of images in this, uh, in this setup. So that's the idea. Uh, it was based on um, a postulate of the way space-time behaves. So uh, I think people didn't initially uh, understand what we were trying to do. Uh, postulating that the vacuum has an entropy associated with it and it fluctuates, I think people found very confusing. And so what we decided to do was to go to a well-controlled setting, ADS CFT, where all the quantities that we're going to compute are very well-defined. Uh, and then it'll be very clear what precisely it is that we're computing. And when I say microscopics are sort of under control, of course, it's not well understood how precisely to do bulk reconstruction. So what we're still gonna be looking at uh, macroscopic uh, observables. So here's our setup. We have the boundary. We have a causal diamond that is propagating into the bulk. And then we're going to anchor our mirror 
on the surface sigma. The surface sigma, for those of you who are familiar, is the Ryu Takinagi surface. And so now what we're going to do is to compute fluctuations in the position of that Ryu Takinagi surface. And as a result, infer what is the fluctuation in the time that it takes for a, um, a, a photon, which is emitted from a point on the boundary, reflects on a point in the bulk, and then comes back. I should comment that, of course, we need to regulate the position of the boundary. So one way to think about this is in terms of a randall sundrum brain model uh, with this causal diamond being on the brain. Uh, you don't have to formulate it that way. You just need to make sure that, that uh, the location of the boundary has been regulated in order to get uh, a finite result. So again, we're gonna restrict ourselves to a finite part of the boundary or uh, not the entire uh, boundary, okay? And the region that we're gonna look, look at is a spherical region on the boundary B, and it corresponds to a causal diamond in the bulk anchored to the boundary. Now, because this is ADS CFT, the modular Hamiltonian is well defined in terms of an integral of the CFT stress tensor, again, uh, contracted with the space time volume and the, and the killing vector. Now, similar to what I uh, talked about briefly in the context of Minkowski, because I have this finite, uh, I have part of the, the volume within this causal diamond, there's a metric transformation that allows me to relate the ordinary Poincaré coordinates to these topological black hole coordinates. Again, this is only possible because I'm restricting myself to the causal diamond. And in ADS, rather than being lin linear, it's quadratic in, uh, in this coordinate R. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to go to uh, these topological black hole coordinates, R and T, which are related to the ordinary Poincaré coordinates in this way. And you can uh, take a look at our ADS CFT paper to get the details of how we do this. So by the ADS CFT correspondence, the thermal bath of the CFT is related to the appropriate black hole in the bulk. And so now you can take advantage of the ADS CFT dictionary to compute the uh, entanglement entropy um, of the, the boundary and the uh, corresponding topological black hole in the bulk, and then uh, compute uh, not only the uh, entanglement entropy, which is equivalent to the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian, which depends again on the free energy, but then you can just go ahead and compute the fluctuations as well. And you can actually either do this on the boundary or in the bulk theory, uh, it's been done both ways in the literature. We chose to do the calculation in, in the bulk theory. And so you can grind through this calculation and it turns out that the fluctuations in the modular Hamiltonian are exactly the area of the Ryu Takayanagi surface on 4G. So in other words, the fluctuations in uh, the modular energy is exactly equal to the expectation value of the modular energy. So the, the, the coefficient between those two is one. So now we have these modular energy fluctuations and we want to know how the bulk metric reacts to these modular energy fluctuations. So we go through the same procedure that I talked about earlier uh, where we're, we uh, now take this topological black hole metric, but now we allow for uh, metric fluctuations around the, uh, around the vacuum. And now we can compute how this uh, metric fluctuation is related to these modular energy fluctuations. And so this is the, the answer. The mass, quote unquote mass of the topological black hole is just the fluctuation in the modular energy. And you can show this using the ADS CFT uh, dictionary um, that you use the first law, law of black hole thermodynamics, that the fluctuation in this modular Hamiltonian is related to the thermodynamics uh, of the black hole, uh, top in this case, topological black hole in the bulk. 
And so this allows one then to compute then the back reaction due to this energy fluctuation in any number of uh, d plus one dimensions in the bulk. So at the end of this, you find that the metric fluctuation in the bulk goes like the modular fluctuation. And then there's a, a G on A that enters. Okay, so the bottom line here is that the metric, the uh, so of course the expectation value of phi vanishes because we're in the in the uh, vacuum, but it has fluctuations about that zero point, and they go like L Planck squared on L squared, where L squared here is is the ADS scale. So if you take the square root of that to get the typical amplitude, you again get that the size of the fluctuation goes linearly with L Planck. So now we need to take the last step in this, which is to convert this into the change in the time that it takes to go from the bottom of the causal diamond to the top of the causal diamond. So this was accomplished by doing a, um, uh, a coordinate transformation. And again, I would encourage you to consult the paper for the details on how we do this. But we again, we find that the length fluctuation squared goes uh, like the square root of the expectation value of phi squared. So once again, we find that the length fluctuation squared goes like L Planck. So we're finding the same type of behavior with the same type of angular correlations that I was uh, um, highlighting before. So, uh, so what is it that I think uh, are the strong and the weak points of this argument? So the, I, I've been uh, you know, centering this discussion around this three-step argument, which the first was to calculate the fluctuations in the energy of the vacuum. So in ADS-CFT, this can be calculated with no assumptions. So in Minkowski, you have to assume that a similar type of behavior uh, happens. And from my perspective, this um, one can make a strong case that, that even in flat space, one has a similar type of, uh, a similar type of um, horizon and, uh, entanglement uh, entropy. And I think that there's a long history actually in the literature that supports that point of view. Now, the part of this that I think uh, is, is harder to um, accept is not this step, <laughs> okay. Then you compute the back reaction of the metric in these topological black hole coordinates, which is also just a very straightforward step. Phi squared goes like G squared on L, L to the fourth, and then you get this enhancement of the entanglement entropy. So once you accept step one, even in Minkowski space, this step also follows. In my mind, uh, if one were going to uh, question the weakest step in this argument, it's to calculate these length fluctuations from the metric fluctuations and turn that into an observable. And the reason why I say that is because we don't understand yet how to fully do bulk reconstruction. Okay, so in order to get around that, what we've done is to take these uh, um, quantities that are, are averaged quantities and to relate them to uh, the way a, a photon travels by doing a, a coordinate transformation. And that means that one power of this metric fluctuation actually goes like the product of the length fluctuations. And that's where a square root um, comes in to the length fluctuations. So you would like to have an independent formulation of this. So I, I spent quite a bit of time uh, thinking about this and let me uh, tell you a bit about this. I know I don't have much time left. So I um, thought about uh, what we know in the context of ADS-CFT. And then because I'm a model builder by training, I, I asked the question of whether there's a simple model that would allow one to get a better handle on the local behavior. <laughs> of these metric fluctuations. And this model, and the degree of freedom associated with those fluctuations, I called the pixelon. And the reason why I call it the pixelon is because it's a degree of freedom associated with uh, the um, pixels, the space-time pixels, 
for which there is uh, an area's worth of these degrees of freedom. So there, I, I'm the basis of this model is to say, okay, I'm gonna take this entanglement entropy and interpret it as a space-time volume having degrees of freedom and degrees of freedom, which is set by the area of the um, entangling surface. It turns out that, that this global quantity doesn't matter very much. You can always think of it in terms of an entanglement or an entropy density, but let's just go with this for the moment. Um, and then the other result from ABS CFT is that there are fluctuations that also go with the area of the entanglement uh, entangling surface in the context of ADS CFT, that's the Ryu Takinagi surface. If you look at the energy fluctuation per degree of freedom, delta K and K, that's going to go like one on the square root of these number of degrees of freedom, which is a really small number. So I have bosonic degrees of freedom because they're associated with these metric fluctuations and their energy per degree of freedom is very small. Now I go ahead and say, similar to any, any quantum field theory restricted to the diamond has a thermal density matrix. So I'm gonna look at the thermal density matrix for these bosonic fluctuations. And the energy per degree of freedom is motivated by ADS CFT. Delta K on K is very small. So in other words, I need to expand this density matrix uh, in, this, in the small beta omega limit. And that implies that I'm gonna have a high occupation number. Now, once I have this bosonic degree of freedom with a high occupation number, then what I need to do is to couple it gravitationally to the interferometer mirror and see what it does to the position fluctuations in the mirror that I can, I can measure. So you just take the Fierce Pauli action and you couple these metric fluctuations to the mirror and um, one way to compute these mirror fluctuations, which I think Malik is going to talk about uh, um, for the case of gravitons, is via the influence functional. So I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, Malik is going to talk about the influence functional. There are other ways to compute it as well. Um, but it's nice to see that these length fluctuations, now in the Feynman-Vernon paper, I highly recommend it. It's a you know, really beautiful paper. <laughs> it almost describes the whole system in terms of electronics circuits. You have a test system, which in this case would be the interferometer, which is coupled to some bath of oscillators. And in our case, we're interested in this bath of pixelon oscillators, which has a very high density of states. It probably shouldn't surprise you that at the end of going through this calculation, these length fluctuations are gonna depend on the density of states. And then of course it's because you're coupling it gravitationally, it goes like G Newton. And that density of states now is a high occupation number and that enhances these fluctuations. And so as a result of this enhancement by the square root of the entropy, the length fluctuation squared again goes like one power of L Planck, okay? So this is a model for understanding uh, how uh, one could um, derive this type of behavior from a simple kind of um, effective field theory or model approach. So I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm out of time. So when I started thinking about the observational consequences of quantum gravity, I think my you know, guiding light was in some sense, this very simple intuition about random walk behavior which has some you know, phenomenological issues. But eventually uh, this led to some very well posed questions in the context of ADS CFT and also a simple formulation in terms of a scalar field with a high density of states. There are still many open questions to address. I think to, I'm trying to formulate this again from a more conservative point of view, trying to see whether this effect exists within the kinds of um, setups that appear within, you know, just sort of standard kind of string calculations. Um, and then I'd also like to think about implications for cosmology and astrophysics. I think one of the issues with this feature or bug, I'm not sure which, is that the effects always occur dominantly up for the low L modes, low curly L, low spherical harmonic. So you always want to be looking at observables 
where the angular separation is uh, the angular separation is um, is maximal to be measuring different parts of the space time. If I look, at, you know, towards one object which is far away, then I'm measuring just one part of the space time volume, and this effect completely vanishes. So I think there are a lot of different directions to pursue. I do think that it deserves attention, um, both from the theoretical and the and the observational side. So thanks. I'll stop there. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so we're actually about five minutes over with that. And this work, in my experience, elicits a long, heated discussion every time. So I'm going to actually suggest that uh, we punt these questions to the very long discussion period after Malik's talk um, and just go straight into Malik, if that's OK with you, Catherine. That's fine with me. OK, good. Okay, so <clears throat> shall I just continue? Let yeah, thanks. Un... Can you hear my, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see your screen. All right, that's coming next. Um... Okay. Um, I think this should work. Um, yeah. How's that? Uh, yeah, looks good. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can see the animation. Yes. A... Very nice. very oh, good. fancy. All right. So we'll have a very right. fancy talk by Molly. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you might be. And thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me to speak. So the Study of noise has often played an important role in the history of physics. It was unexplained noise in the in radio receivers that, that led Penzias and Wilson to discover the cosmic microwave background. And of course, it was Brownian noise and the motion of pollen grains that led Einstein and Smolotrovsky to come up with an explanation that involved um, discrete molecules. And what I'd like to tell you about today is that similarly, there could be noise in gravitational wave uh, detectors, and that noise uh, should reveal to us the, uh, can, can reveal to us the, the existence of the quantization of gravity and uh, heuristically the existence of gravitons. And basically the approach we're gonna take is I'm gonna treat gravity as the space-time metric as a quantum field, not as a classical field, but as a quantum field. And we're gonna work out the observational consequences of that. Uh, and we're gonna look at the consequences of that on the motion of free falling objects. And what we'll find is that free falling objects will have random fluctuations or noise. And these fluctuations can be thought of heuristically as due to the bombardment of the objects by gravitons. And you can see in this artist illustration that that's what's happening to this apple. If you imagine these and gravitons clearly are these little exploding triangles. All right, so uh, this was work done in collaboration with Frank Wilczek uh, at MIT and George Zahariade, who is my uh, former postdoc at, at uh, Arizona State University. He's now at um, Barcelona. And we wrote a series of uh, three papers so far. The first of these, uh, The Noise of Gravitons, was an essay that uh, won the Gravity Research Foundation competition last year. And there are also two technical papers, which are uh, shown uh, below a short one and a long one. Let me see if I can uh, uh, turn on my pointer. Yeah, can you can you see the pointer? Uh, I can see the pointer. These actually. are the references in case you want to look at the details. All right. So what we started, what we tried to do in a fairly rigorous way was to look at the um, question of whether gravitational wave detectors could be sensitive to the quantization of gravity. Um, and there, there were some arguments, and especially from heuristic arguments, especially by Dyson, that says that this was impossible. And we thought we should look at it in a, in a, in a kind of more serious way or more uh, rigorous way. So uh, gravitational waves, as you know, are traveling deformations of uh, the space-time metric um, of space. And so a ring of satellites 
because of that deformation of space would be stretched and squeezed like this. And these satellites, of course, are free falling objects. They're, they're just uh, moving on geodesics, but those geodesics are themselves the distance to those ge uh, between those geodesics changes or deviates as the gravitational wave passes through. And that deviation is described mathematically by the geodesic deviation equation, which is, a, of course, one of the very important equations of general relativity. Uh, and it says that uh, the deviation vector xi, which is a space-like vector, has some uh, time double time derivative, which depends on the curvature of space-time given by this Riemann tensor. And in the context of a gravitational wave, the Riemann tensor uh, uh, takes this form. And so when you plug this equation into, into the first line, uh, what you get is this last equation. And this is gonna be an important equation in this talk, so keep it in mind. Uh, mathematically, it's known as a Hill equation. I've dropped the uh, tensorial indices for simplicity, uh, but that's the equation that we observe at LIGO, where xi, you can think of as the distance between two Free falling particles, and this is the, and h is the amplitude of the gravitational wave. Okay. And that's exactly what is observed at uh, gravitational wave detectors. Here there's LISA. You can see that these are clearly three free falling satellites, and xi then would be this, this the length of these arm, the separation between them. And that's also true in, uh, in, in LIGO, where the two mirrors of the endpoints of these arms. Uh, are really uh, actually free falling at least in two directions. They're uh, free to move. Uh, and so xi is the, the geodesic deviation equation, the geodesic, uh, sorry, deviation. So it is, you can think of it as a, just as length of the arm. Okay, so the question we would like to ask then is what happens to this equation when the space-time metric is treated as a quantum field? So this is, of course, a, this equation is derived from classical GR, and we'd like to know what happens if we think of the metric as a quantum mechanical, as a, as a quantum field. So here's our model. Um, well, it's not much of a model, it's, it's the real thing in a way. Um, so uh, if we take a, uh, we can sort of distill a gravitational wave uh, experiment as basically uh, two free falling masses whose distance, is, whose geodesic separation has been measured. So we'll call those masses capital M and little m naught. And xi then is the uh, vector that connects the two. And for simplicity, we're gonna take capital M to be very, very heavy. Um, the reason for doing that is that then we can sort of put that on shell and, uh, and then and we'll put it at the origin of our coordinates. So then xi becomes just the position of the second particle. Uh, we don't have to do that. We could have kept both the masses uh, in there and then we, would, we could have taken the center of mass uh, limit or something. Um, but this is a kind of a Keplerian limit that helps to reduce the problem to one, de to one degree of freedom rather than two. Okay, and when we do that, here, here's, our, well, here's our action. And you can see that this, this, there's really no hocus pocus going on. This is just very uh, elementary and very fundamental uh, physics here. This is the Einstein-Hilbert action over here. Uh, and then there's a there's a, the point particle action of two um, minimally coupled um, uh, particles with mass capital M and M naught moving in that background where G mu nu is the metric. And now we're gonna, we can, I'll gloss over the details because of the shortness of time, but we're gonna use Fermi normal coordinates to put, uh, to anchor, the capital M uh, particle. And so then we'll let the, uh, the coordinates of the other one be Y, which will be described in these coordinates by T and Xi. Uh, and then we can use our, uh, our relation between the metric, between the, uh, between the Riemann tensor and H, and uh, we can expand the metric to, uh, to second order as we do. And here H is the uh, metric fluctuation. And what we then get is this action. Okay, and furthermore, we can then take this action and write down the metric in terms of, uh, we'll, we can break it down into Fourier modes, where now Q is the amplitude of the kth mode. Okay, so K is the wave uh, vector, and Q is the amplitude of that uh, mode, and then there's some uh, polarization tensor and so on. Okay, and when we do that, 
and we're going to uh, put the whole system in a finite box. So that's why it's a sum, not an integral. And when we put the um, put the this this uh, decomposition into the original action, here's what we get. Okay, so I want to just tell you how simple this action is by focusing on one single mode. We're going to, of course, consider all the modes because it's a field theory. But let me just show you by focusing on one single graviton mode how simple the action then is. And remember, this is coming straight from GR plus two particles. Okay, so if I look at a just one mode, I don't have that sum anymore. And Q is the amplitude of the wave. Here's my action. So the first part here, that's just the action of a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, and uh, omega is the frequency of the, uh, of the harmonic oscillator, which is the, actually the frequency of the gravitational mode, gravitational wave mode. And M here is a dimensional, is an uh, artificial mass that we uh, created. It uh, comes from the volume of space time and it's unphysical and will play no role in any of the calculations. We'll drop out of everything. Meanwhile, um, Xi, we also have another piece here, which is a free particle action. That's just one half mv squared. Uh, and m naught here is the mass of, the, of that other free particle, which in the case of LIGO would be a mirror of 40 kilograms. Uh, and xi is a, uh, the position of that uh, of, uh, relative to the origin. And then finally, there's an interaction term. An interaction term is a little complicated. It's a Yukawa type interaction term uh, um, with some derivatives. And that's what you uh, get when you just work everything out. And G is a coupling constant, which depends on, and not, of course, by the equivalence principle. OK, so this is what uh, we get. And you can see that this is a very simple action, uh, even with this term, because notice that Q appears no more than quadratically. All right. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to integrate out Q. And because of the fact that Q appears no more than quadratically, we will be able to do the quantum mechanics of this exactly. In other words, we're not going to be use, using perturbation theory. We'll actually be able to do the path integrals because it's just a Gaussian path integral. OK, so here's our strategy. We want to calculate the effect of a quantized gravitational field on the gravitational detector, right? That's our goal. And we have our action, and we, so we can quantize the theory. Okay, so we have an action, we can just put it in a path integral, and that'll be formally, at least, the quantum theory. So we're going to assume that the gravitational field is initially in some state psi, okay, which could be anything. So we'll talk about what psi is later. Uh, and then we don't know what the final state of the field is. The final state of the field is not psi, right? Because the gravitational field interacts with the detector and so uh, after it has uh, interacted, you know, it, it transmits energy, for example, the detector starts to uh, move. Um, after it's done that, it's sort of in an entangled state in some way. So we don't, we're not going to um, um, say what the final state of the gravitational field is. And what we want to do then is we want to calculate the transition probability of the detector to go from state A to state B in time T. Now, that might seem like a strange thing to do because we're treating the, even the detector quantum mechanically. But of course, the re in reality, the detector is this 40 kilogram object. And so at the end of the day, we're going to take a classical limit uh, and we'll, uh, effect, ob we'll obtain the effective uh, equations of motion of the detector. But uh, for now, we're going to treat everything quantum mechanically because we have our action. We can just quantize this full system. All right. So um, more precisely, this is what we want to calculate. And we want to calculate the probability of the detector going from state A to state B, all right? And so the, those, those states A and B could be position eigenstates of, uh, of the field psi, if you like, uh, or, uh, or any other state, you, uh, we don't really care. Uh, in the presence of a gravitational field that is initially in a state psi, okay? And we're gonna then, uh, that's a probability, so it's a square. Um, and since we're summing over final, we don't know what the final state of the gravitational field is, so we have to sum over final states. So uh, we have an initial state psi and A and a final state F and B. And then there's a unitary time evolution operator, which is simply obtained by, um, from that action, you take the Legendre transformation to find the Hamiltonian and then you exponentiate that. So that's what we want to calculate, okay? 
So these amplitudes are uh, can be evaluated as path integrals, all right? And because it's a probability, we're gonna get a double path integral. And the important thing is uh, we can calculate these path integrals exactly because they are, um, at least in this linearized theory, because they are quadratic. Okay, so uh, I want to, I know I don't have a lot of time, but so I'm just, but I, I do want to show some of the details. Uh, so for the next five slides, I'm going to have some details and then we'll get to the punchline. Uh, so uh, I, just bear with me. So these are the five slides of, um, of some slightly more technical. So as Catherine mentioned, the uh, approach here is uh, perfectly suited towards uh, the, the formalism developed by Feynman and Vernon in their gorgeous paper uh, of 1963. And what Feynman and Vernon considered was a very general thing. They said, supposing you have two systems, all right, they're interacting two quantum systems, but we only have access to or interest in one of them. This is often the case where one could be in the environment and, uh, and one could be the system of interest, or maybe there are two quantum systems coupled in some way and we're not interested in one of them. Um, so, but because they're interacting, the one, even the one that we're not interested in is gonna leave some imprint, it's gonna affect or influence the first system, the one we are interested in. And what Feynman and Vernon uh, were able to show is that if we know the form of the interaction, we can calculate the full complete effects of that other system, the one we're not measuring. Uh, and that's encoded its influence is encoded in what they called the influence functional. And that influence functional is a double path integral as well. Okay, and so what that really means in our context, we're, we, we direct, we only have access to the position of the mirror. That's what we're actually measuring. And we're not directly able to measure the state of the gravitational field. So we don't have access to that system. And we wanna see the influence of that on the uh, thing that we do measure, which is the position of the mirror, okay? So, uh, so we want to find the influence functional for that. And uh, here it is, for, okay. Um, the details are in the paper. And when we do that, uh, we, can, we get basically this kind of, the, for the magnitude of the influence functional, uh, we get this sort of expression. And so I want to just uh, point and where capital X here is the second derivative of the square of the position. But what I wanna point out here is that this is the exponential with a minus sign of something that's quadratic in X. So it's itself a kind of a Gaussian looking uh, object. And then we can use a mathematical trick. Um, we call it the Feynman-Vernon trick, but in the literature, it's called the hubbard stratanovich transform. And it basically says that if you have any exp expression like, that looks like that, you can imagine that that's the result of doing a Gaussian integral. Okay, so you can make an, you can take any, uh, any expression of this form can be written through an auxiliary uh, integral over some auxiliary uh, quantity y. So the infinite dimensional generalization of this um, so simple formula takes this expression, which is now a path, which is now a, uh, there's a double integral on top, and that turns that into a path integral, not just an ordinary integral, but because of the form of this into a path integral over some auxiliary variable n, uh, which appears in this Gaussian way, okay, as a square uh, and also as a linear piece. So what's the meaning of n? n has a is basically a zero mean, okay, uh, Gaussian stochastic function and where a here is the autocorrelation function. So this has the interpretation of noise. So when we plug that uh, into our uh, Feynman into our influence functional. Here's our uh, full expression. Again, this is too much to explain in this kind of talk, uh, but uh, we can calculate basically everything. All right, now this is a, the transition probability uh, for the detector to go from state A to state B. But really we wanna take the, um, take, find its effective cl uh, classical motion. So we're gonna take a saddle point and actually a double saddle point because it's a double path integral. Okay, and when we do that, here's what we get. This is our, the main result, um, the equation that, um, well, our key equation. So what we get is that that Hill equation that we had earlier, which showed you how the, uh, how the um, 
length of the arm was affected by the wave, that now changes into this equation. So again, uh, we now have on the right, we have three pieces. We have the first piece, that's our original classical gravitational wave. Remember we had psi double dot equals one half h double dot psi, and we still have that here. But now we have two additional pieces. This third piece here, that's an interesting piece here. That's a radiation reaction term. You would get something similar in electrodynamics, but there it's a cube instead of a, uh, phi powers. Uh, and this is also known if you look at Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, uh, there's this expression already worked out there. But the new expression is this. So because of the, uh, because of our form of our influence functional, we had three path integrals here, not just two. So even after we take the saddle point over these two, we're left with an auxiliary path integral over this N, this noise uh, that we got from, um, from integrating out gravity. And so this is a quantum noise. And so that, this equation here is no longer a deterministic equation. It's a stochastic equation. Okay, so it's more like a Langevin equation that you get in Brownian motion. And that's sort of what you'd expect, right? If you couple a classical object to a quantum system, the sort of hallmark of quantum systems are that they're probabilistic. And if you integrate out the quantum system, then the imprint of that probability uh, is that the classical system is no longer deterministic, but stochastic. And so we get this stochastic equation here, uh, where, that, where this is the noise term. And I put a subscript psi on the noise to remind you that the properties of the noise, its, it's statistical properties, its autocorrelation function, its standard deviation and so on, uh, are dependent on the state of the gravitational field. Okay, so this is our key equation. So uh, intuitively, it's gonna look like this. This is the classical story. We have two particles here that are moving. These are, this is the space-time diagram, time goes up. These are the world lines. Uh, and here's their separation psi. Initially, what you'd have is a, you'd have a classical gravitational wave H that comes in, uh, and that's uh, the, this psi is affected by the geodesic deviation equation, like so, by this Hill equation, and that's the original behavior. But now we find that when H is regarded as a quantum ob object, then the result, the change in the dynamics of psi is basically it's no longer looks just like a deterministic equation, but there's some noise, there's some fluctuations, and that's given by the derivative of n. Okay, so that's our result. Um, and so, the, for this uh, audience, the question is uh, an important question: is is the noise detectable? Well, just generally, for the noise to be detectable, we need two things: we need the amplitude to be not too small. And then we need the spectrum should, should be distinguishable from, uh, from uh, other sources of noise. Otherwise, um, well, we saw early in an earlier talk today that there were many other uh, types of noise. And so we need to be able to uh, isolate our noise from that other noise. So this is fundamental quantum gravitational noise. Okay. So the good news is that the power spectrum is explicitly calculable for many classes of quantum states. So we, we've, we worked it out for uh, four broad classes. We looked at the vacuum. So we looked at the, we took the initial gravitational field state to be a vacuum, or we could take a thermal state or coherent state or squeeze states. And in each of these cases, cases you can exactly calculate and obtain the power spectrum of the noise. Even better, the noise actually appears to be correlated between multiple detectors. So if you take a second detector somewhere else, it could be not even, it could be, I don't know if it can be all the way in Louisiana between, uh, well, but it can be, it can be a, away from the first detector, then um, that, that, that uh, those fluctuations are actually correlated. So that should help greatly in identifying what the, uh, the that this is a fundamental noise, because that'll be distinguished from seismic noise and many other uh, kinds of noise, local noise, including photon shot noise. Okay, so what about the amplitude? So when we calculate the amplitude, we find uh, that the variance of the fluctuation, this is the size of the fluctuation, right? How much does the arm length fluctuate as a result of this quantum gravitational effect? Uh, that is gonna be determined, given by the integral of the 
noise power spectrum, uh, and there's an arm length there, the, the, the default arm length. And then there's also a cutoff due to the detector sensitivity. That's gonna be very important. And when we plug this in for the case of LIGO, uh, we find that uh, unfortunately, and probably as Dyson uh, intuitively expected, that at least for the vacuum state or for coherent states, all right, the, the size of that fluctuation is, is absolutely unobservable, right? It's uh, Planckian, essentially. Uh, for thermal states like cosmic gravitational background or Hawk evaporating Hawking black holes, it's a little bit better, okay, but still far outside the realm of observability. Uh, here you might imagine that the temperature could, of the black hole could be arbitrarily high, but of course the, the, the brighter, the, the hotter the black hole, the smaller it is, and so the angular frequency, the angular uh, measurement unfortunately compensates for the, a bit for the, well, the benefits you gain from the high temperature. And so you don't get much of an, that much of an improvement. But for squeeze states, and there are reasons to expect uh, that there could be squeeze states um, from cosmology and also from the, just more prosaically from nonlinear effects at, uh, in sort of, uh, at the final stages of black hole mergers, for example, um, we might expect that the general state there is described by a squeeze state we find that there's an exponential enhancement of the noise in terms of the squeezing parameter r, okay? So if we were so fortunate as to get a squeeze state, uh, uh, then we would find uh, greatly enhanced noise. And this r can really be quite large and uh, would have enable us to see this sort of correlated um, fluctuation. Okay, uh, I just want to, another uh, point though, that when we wrote down this formula to, to obtain these estimates for the variance of the fluctuation, um, we, the finiteness of this answer came about from this cutoff, this omega max. This power spectrum itself is actually divergent. In fact, it goes linearly with frequency. So that's very different from the kinds of other noises that you typically find. So this is uh, usually a linearly growing um, power spectrum. Uh, and we only get a finite answer because of this cutoff. So, so here for our purposes, the best hope for detection of this kind of fundamental gravitational noise would be some kind of experiment that's sensitive to high frequencies. Okay, because the higher the, the frequency, the big, high, greater this cutoff here, and so the larger the uh, fluctuation. Um, so I'd like to invite or welcome the uh, discussion with experimentalists in particular. I don't know very much about this, uh, but if there are any prospects of really looking at high frequency measurements of gravitational waves. Um, good, so let me end here with the summary. Uh, we've developed a formalism to consider general relativity in which the space-time metric was treated as a quantum field. Okay, so this is a very, very uh, basic kind of approach, which uh, is sh almost surely true. Um, it's sort of agnostic about the UV completeness of, of the theory of quantum gravity, whether it's string theory or holography or loop quantum gravity, we didn't use any of those features. Uh, so it's a bit uh, or, um, orthogonal to what, complementary rather to what uh, Catherine was talking about. Uh, so this, this effect is uh, just from basically effective field theory. Uh, the reason we're getting these interesting effects is partly due to the feynman Wernon influence functional and partly because well, we have to, if we assume a very interesting uh, initial state, like a squeeze state, we can get a greatly enhanced effect. And uh, the, as, as we noted, there are potentially observable quantum gravity effects here on earth. Um, and again, I also wanna say that this, the model that we use was really the real thing. We, okay, we made some simplifying assumptions, mainly that we didn't, um, include the other graviton polarization. We sort of glossed over sums over angles, but we did do the integral over all modes actually in getting the answer. And we find that uh, falling objects don't just fall straight down, um, but uh, as Newton discovered in an earlier pandemic or epidemic, um, <clears throat> but uh, instead uh, experienced quantum jitters whose form depends on the quantum state of the gravitational field. And I'm very happy with it because it brings together work of my heroes here, 
uh, gravitational waves, Brownian motion, and quantum mechanics. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks for clear, Malik. Um, so I think, uh, okay, so we're like five minutes over in total, and then, but we have a 45 minute discussion section. So I, I would suggest maybe we take one, one or two targeted questions and then move to the broader 